Okay, let's sit down and uh, let's start. So a few uh, remarks is that the scores, the scores of quiz one and exam one will be released in Duke, uh, like like in the next hours. The TAs are working on it because some students have switched sessions and they want to make sure that everything is consistent. So that will be released. You should have that before uh, 8 o'clock tonight or so. So you'll get an uh, Excel worksheet. I hope that you can open it on your computer where you have a student idea and you probably know your own student idea and uh, the scores for quiz one, exam one, etc. The second thing is I found a really, so, so I went to the DMV yesterday by the way. So I was driving around with a uh, New Mexico driver's license, yeah, in California for like three years, yeah. No big deal. I also have a Dutch driver's license, yeah. So, but anyway, then my, mine expired at the end of March and then I went over to the DMV in Lacuna Hills, was really busy. So after about five minutes I decided, hey, I'm going back home and I'm going to make an appointment, yeah. So do that. When you go to the DMV, make an appointment. Much, much, much better. So I made an appointment, but it was yesterday. So finally got my California driver license, yeah. Isn't that an achievement? It's unbelievable. So happy with it. But anyway, I, it reminds me because there's here a, a student card, UC Irvine, a person called Jared. Is there a Jared in this room? No? Looks a lot like. Uh, no, yeah, let's not make that joke because it's inappropriate. <laughs> But, uh, okay, so, uh, are, are any questions, concerns, comments, speak up. You can say anything you like. Talk about your family or your pet or other courses. Okay, that looks really uh, interactive. <laughs> so, um, so we will continue where we left off on Wednesday. Uh, so chapter six is on finding the roots of a function, which means finding that value of x for which fx is zero. We covered the methods like bracketing. So with bracketing, you start with a minimum x value, a maximum x value, you divide that interval into a predefined number of locations. For each of those locations, you calculate the function value. And then you just check from one location to the next whether the sign of the function value has changed. Because if you know that the sign of the function value has changed, then you know that the function suddenly went from negative to positive or from positive to negative and the only way that that's possible is that it crossed the line y is zero. So bracketing returns an interval. And obviously you can use a lot of locations but that's computationally very inefficient. So bracketing gives you an interval in which the root lies. But bracketing can be wrong. If you specify intervals that are too large, you might miss the root. Yeah, you might have a function that looks like this. Like let's say this is y is zero, yeah, here. And we have a function that looks like this. So there's two roots here. And I specify that I have two function values here. This is my interval. So then my sign here is positive. My sign here is positive, and then I conclude there is no root in this interval, whereas in reality the function crossed the y is zero at two places. So bracketing is not ideal, but it's nice to program and to get some idea how that works in practice. Then we have the fixed point iteration. 
You can forget about that because that's more analytical. It's not so easy to program that in MATLAB, okay? That requires first a number of analytical steps and then you program your final result. So forget about that. Then we have the bisection method. So the bisection method is an improvement of bracketing. Bisection starts with an interval, like the same as with bracketing, but instead of dividing the, inter, uh, the interval between x min and x max into a predefined number of locations, it simply halves the interval, compares the sign of the function in the midpoint with that of the left side and the right side, and then determines if the left and the middle are the same sign, then automatically the root must lie in the other interval. And then we have that interval. And then again, you compare the half of this interval with the sign here and the sign here. And that's how you keep going. Again, by section, you might have the same problem. It's, it's way more efficient than bracketing, typically. But still, it's not ideal. Then we talked about Newton's method. Now, Newton's method is simply a, a simple recipe. So, let's go to Newton's method. And this is the rule, line 54. The book gives you more background information. I'm not going to rewrite all that in my script. But the essential rule is that Newton's method is an iterative method. So, you start at the certain x value that you specify and then Newton's method will give you the root ultimately and it does so in a number of steps and the update rule to go from x to a better x so a better estimate of the root is simply by subtracting from the current x the ratio between the function value at that x value and the derivative of that function at that x value. That's Newton's method. So we have two scripts. We have Newton easy. And Newton easy is easy because I automatically use the symbolic toolbox in MATLAB to, de to derive the derivative of the function because the Newton's method needs the derivative of the function. So not only the original function, which we know with an inline function we can specify the original fx, value, uh, FX uh, relationship, but it also needs its derivative. And MATLAB can do that if you use the symbolic toolbox on line 19 where I define fun is no longer a numerical function but becomes an analytical function that's essentially what this statement does by saying it's symbolic now and then one line later I say df dx is the derivative is simply diff y and diff y is the the derivative of our symbolic function and then I have to specify this line because this ends up with a analytical function which we cannot numerically evaluate and that's why I make on line 28 I make a inline function out of that function so that I can evaluate df dx at any given x value and then essentially what we have is if we go to the top of our script the output is the root this is the name of the function, and that's what you also see here. It's called Newton Easy dot M. Input is the function, inline function. X0 is the starting point. Remember, it's an iterative method, so X0 is specified by the user. And N is the number of iterations you like to do. Now, what you do here then, you just fill out that equation is for k is 1 to n, so k is our counter, n is the total number of iterations we like to do. The first thing we do is we evaluate the function value at the current x value. That's what happens over here. So x is a scalar, x is the starting point in the first iteration. We evaluate the function value. 
Then on line 43, we calculate the derivative of the function at that given x value. And then on line 46, we fill out Newton's method, where the new x is the old x minus the function value at this x divided by the derivative at this x. And that's, that should give us a new x. And then on line 49, we print this to the screen. And then ultimately, after out of this loop, so once we've done this n times, because we make n updates of x, yeah? After we're done with this for loop, so as soon as k is n, then we, eat, uh, we reach this end over here, and then what we say, we return the root, so we say r is x, our estimate of x is now the root, so r, because I specify as output argument here r. So I need to state at the end here what R actually is. If I don't do that, MATLAB is going to crash because it's going to say, hey, I executed your entire script, but you're asking me for R, and in this whole script there's no R. So that's why we have this statement here at the end, and R stands for root. So this is the Newton Easy script. Now what you've seen, that if you execute this script, and we can do this again, let's specify the function here, this is our function, yeah, and we start with clear and then CLC, so we now we have our inline function, yeah, so for any given x value I can, I can calculate what's y, and what I specify is, I specify x0, so my starting point, I specify how many iterations, and then I simply run this script. And what you see here is Newton Easy continues up to 10 iterations because k starts at 0, okay? I could also have k let, uh, started at 1 and this would have been 10. But anyway, from 0 to 9 is 10 steps because I specified n is 10. And what you see here is the evolution of the function value, the derivative, and the estimate of the root. And what you see here is that after about two or three iterations, the estimate of the root is already pretty good, because if you look at the function value, after three, uh, uh, four iterations, so at k is 3, you see 3.266 times 10 to the power minus 9. Now that's pretty close to zero. So why would you continue running this script if you already found the answer? You see, it's not changing here anymore, yeah? And that's why we have a new script called Newton that has convergence criteria. So instead of just running it till we're done, up to n, number of iterations n, we stop as soon as we satisfied certain criteria that we set. And that's what happens over here, is we can specify our tolerance on x. In other words, if the change in x from one iteration to the next is smaller than 1 e minus 6, the script will terminate, because the script will say, you know, your estimate of the root your update of x, your change of that root value is so small, smaller than 1 e minus 6, I am happy with that, I'm okay with that. So instead of letting the computer calculate more and more and more, the computer will stop. And that's the same as with the function value, because we know that ideal, the root is a zero, yeah? But some are happy if we are within 1 e minus 6 of the actual root. So any, anything that lies between minus 1 e minus 6 and 1 e minus 6, those function values, those are all acceptable and the script will terminate. And that's the difference between Newton Easy and the actual Newton script. So this is the exact same script and again here, function, Output argument between square brackets, then function name, then square uh, round brackets, then input argument one, input argument two, three, four, and five. 
Okay? And these MATLAB scripts are defined often that you do not have to include all the input arguments. So, and that's what you see here, is that you have different ways in running this code. In the most simplistic case, you only specify the name of the function and the starting value. And if that is the case, then MATLAB knows that you only specify two input arguments. And what happens then, that, it, that this statement here, on line 19, that's the first statement of the script, that this statement is true, and then automatically the x tolerance will be, will be set to some default value. Now it's the same, you can specify x tol in the, in the header on top, and you might not specify the function tolerance. Now if you do not do that, then this will be executed. So then we know the function tolerance. Now, and the last input argument was for both mode, and that means do we do output writing to the screen or not? If, you're in an, if you start programming, you like output writing to the screen to see what's going on. But once you run this script many, many, many times and you really know all the ins and outs and you know how to program, you're only interested in the final answer. You're no longer interested to get all the other information on the screen. So it's sometimes useful to make your scripts general and include a mode like this. Now here we go into our uh, Newton loop. So the first thing where we say that our starting value that we defined as input argument x0 is our current x value, line 43. We start at iteration counter 0, k is 0, and the maximum number of iterations is 15. So in no way we will ever do more than 15 of those iterations in this while loop. So as long as this k, this counter is smaller or equal to the, the maximum number of iterations, 15. The first thing we do is we update the iteration counter, so because we start at 0 in the first iteration, this will become 1. Then what we do is we evaluate the function value at x and the derivative. So if we look at our example that we have in our lecture script here, we have this fx3n, which is, I showed how to use this Newton easy with an inline function. But you're not limited to inline functions. You can also write your own functions as functions. Like in this case, I wrote a function that's called fx3n, which has as input argument x, and as output argument has the function value at x and the derivative of that function value. And that's what you see on line 5. On line 5 we calculate simply what's the function value at the current value of x. And on line 7 we calculate what's the associate derivative of the function at that value of x. And the derivative on line 7, we computed that analytically ourselves. So it took some effort. That's why I like the Newton Easy script. But, yeah, sometimes it's just hard to derive an analytical derivative, and we'll get back to that later. So we can run this script. Let's see what happens. We specify this. So for the same problem, because this fx3n, this is the same function as our inline function. You see that? This is the same function as our inline function. So we're solving the same problem. But instead, in this case with Newton, we actually have tolerances. We specified specific tolerances on x and the function value. And I said, you know what, let's have output writing to the screen, line 73. So I put the verbose mode to what? I, I 1. I said, okay, I like output writing. So when I execute this, what you see, that instead of doing 10 iterations with Newton Easy, the actual Newton method only needs 4 iterations. Because after 4 iterations, you see that this function value, what we get with this current estimate of the root, is already smaller than 1e minus 6. So 
we're done. The code knows, you know, that estimate is what the user has desired. He doesn't want to have a higher tolerance, so I quit. Obviously, we can do more iterations if you specify more strict convergence criteria on the X and the F. But ultimately, we're going to get the same root value here. And if I now do the fun of R, you see that it's approximately, it's, it is zero. So with only four steps, I found the root. So remember, bracketing or bisection, you need to do many more steps to find the root. And with bracketing, you do a lot of, it's lots of effort and you only get an interval. Here you get a single number and it's actually only derived after four steps. So it's, that's what we call efficient. So in computer programming, what do we care about? We care about codes that get the right answer in the minimum amount of time. So that's a large part of the research that I do. I write all kinds of computer programs that are specifically designed to solve problems in the least amount of time. And you might wonder, why do you care? That's a good question. And that is that we like to apply these codes to really complicated models, like weather models, that require hours to run. Yeah? So we like to find the solution. And if each time you want to run the model one time for a different X value takes three hours, then having an inefficient code is going to make, uh, yeah, it, it makes your research impossible. You'll never find the answer. So in this case, it's way more efficient. So that's why efficiency is important and accuracy. So that's Newton's method. Now, and you can run this with any other code, okay? I also wrote this script over here, another script, but you can, you can, you can try this at home. And uh, so write your own uh, uh, function value. That, that's, a good, uh, that, that's a good thing for XM2, yeah? Write your own function and derivative, compute that analytically. Repl essentially replace fx3n with another script and see whether it works. Check. That's the way how you learn how to program. Now, Newton's method uses an analytical formulation of the derivative. Yeah, we've seen that here. If we go to our, you see here. This is an analytical formulation, an explicit formulation. I put in an X, I immediately get the derivative. But in many cases, we have such a complicated function that we cannot derive an analytical derivative. So we need to do it differently. And that's where the secant method comes in. Instead of using an analytical derivative, the secant method uses a numerical derivative. And just to make sure that you know again what a derivative is, we go back to this script here, a Wikipedia. So I use a lot of Wikipedia, yeah? So I hear Wolf Blitzer talk about like bombings in uh, like uh, Boston, yeah? I go online, I see pictures of the people that did it, and I go to their Facebook in Russia, I read, I see all kind of stuff. So that's how I tend to learn over time, yeah? Yeah, it's a sad thing, but um, that's, when the, that's how, why the Wikipedia was actually made. It's, it's, it's easy to learn a lot of stuff. There's a subject like Legos, yeah, Lego Technic. And you type that in and you get a Wikipedia page and you figure out all the models that were made and why and how, how much they made and all the things that went wrong and that they almost went bank bankrupt. But this is the idea of a derivative and you've had this in high school, yeah? So whereas Newton's method uses an analytical derivative, there's many functions for which we cannot derive an analytical derivative. So we need to derive a numerical approximation and that is possible like if we know the function value at x and we know the function value at x plus some nominal value x plus h yeah then the derivative is defined here
Here's the derivative. Okay, so in the limit of h, that difference that you add to x, going to zero, this will converge to the true derivative, the analytical derivative. So if you make h small enough, you'll get the right derivative, but analytically. So you simply compute the function value for x plus some increment. You know the function value at x, and you divide that by the h value. And if you make h small enough, that's a pretty good estimate of the derivative, f prime x. So if we go back to our lecture here, that's what the secant method does for us here. And I wrote it out here for you, line 85, Wikipedia inspiration. And so essentially secant method does exactly the same as Newton's method, but the derivative is analytic, is no longer derived analytically, but numerically. And now your question is, how do we do that numerically? Now think about the fact that if we go back to this figure, that x is our current or x is our value at the first iteration or our starting value. So we know the x value that we start with and we know what its derivative of what the function value is. Then imagine that the next iteration, k is 1 or k is 2, we have an updated x. And then we know what the function value was of that updated x. So you can approximate this by using the information of two successive iterations. You have all this information. And that is in our script. And again here I have a synopsis, always very useful to do, so that if you type in help that you know how to use this code. So. As input, this function has a function format and a starting point. And you can specify a tolerance on x, a tolerance on the function value, and again, if you want output writing to the screen. And again, the last three, x tool, y tool, and for both are three optional arguments. And the output of the function is r, and that's the root. Now. If the number of input arguments is smaller than 3, we, def de de uh, we set the default for value for x tall. If it's smaller than 4, we set a default value for f tall. And if it's smaller than 5, we simply say we do not want output writing to the screen. So that mode is set to 0. Now, and again, here I say our initial x value is sim is exactly identical to what the user specified, x0. That's why the name is called x0. That's specified by the user as initial starting point. k is 0, the initial value of the counter, and we use 15 iterations. Then on line 47, I do something that is done in the Wikipedia script. So, a little trick, that is that I compute the function value f at the current x value specified by the user as initial value, but I add a very small value to that, plus 0 0.1. And why do I do that? It becomes clear when I go in this script, okay? So this is all the same as Newton's method. And what I define here on line, what is it? 57, after I've updated the counter from 0 to 1, k is now 1, I say that my current function value is my old function value. And why? Because I need to calculate the derivative. I need to know f and f old, and x and x old, and then I can calculate the derivative. So that's what I do. And by adding 0 0.1, f and f old will be different. That's what you see here. Because here, on line 61, I again recompute the function value at the current x, but I no longer add that 0 0.1. 
So now I have one x value with an f and an f alt that are, that are differing 0 0.1. And then I have a statement here that if in the first iteration I do not know in principle, I only have my current x value. I do not have another x value. I only have my starting value. So in the if, if this is true, so if I'm in the initial first iteration, I simply define that the inverse of df dx, so that's essentially dx df, I specify that that's equal to 1. Otherwise, the inverse of df dx, and let this not be, um, yeah, I hope this is clear and uh, that this doesn't confuse you. And you can change this at home if you like. So what I calculate on line 73, if the counter is 2, then what we have, we have our old x value, yeah, our starting x value, we have our new x value, we had our old function value, and we have our new function value. So that's where you can calculate the derivative numerically. But I calculate the inverse of the derivative, so 1 over the derivative. And that's for certain reasons, that's for convenience, but if you want to do it the other way around, if you want to calculate f minus f alt, because that's what the Wikipedia says, yeah, f minus f alt, so that's x plus h, or x minus x plus h, uh, or, or like uh, uh, this is x minus x plus h divided by f minus the function value of f at x plus h. But there's a specific reason. Now I can calculate my dx from this equation. And you can write this out. I think it's also in the book. It's just a numerical little thing. It's an advantage. Where now I calculate that my dx, that's the update of my x value, is the current function value times the inverse of df dx. Now, then I specify at the end here that my current x value becomes my old x value so that in the next iteration after that I update my x value I use x is x minus dx so this rule we know this is Newton's method the dx I derived using analytical derivative uh, and a numerical derivative so what you see here is prior to updating x I first say that my current x value is equal to x old and then I change x. So what you now have is you have an old x value and you have a new x value. And that's exactly what you need in the next loop to calculate on line 73 that derivative numerically. So you use these iterations, but in the first iteration you only have one x value. That's the starting value. In the second iteration you had your starting x value and your new x value. So you had your starting function value and that was the only information you had. But in the second iteration you have your current, uh, your starting x value as an associated uh, uh, function value and your new x value and associated function value and that's what you see over here now and here I have my if statement with a relational operator here a logical operator and a relational operator and we know that this is an or statement so this statement is true if one of the two is true. So they do, if I replace this with an end, then both of them need to be true to be exercising line 90 all the way to line 94. So if one of these two is true, I return to the top of the script and I return the current value of x becomes my root. So again, this is, a, this is a question on quiz two. 
what's the difference between Newton's method and the secant method is that in the secant method you use a numerical approximation of the derivative whereas in Newton's method you need an explicit derivative and in Newton's method so that means explicit derivative that means you need to write that all out yeah, yourself or you need to compute it somehow and that can be very difficult because there's a lot of functions for which you cannot compute a derivative so the secant method is more general because you can apply it to functions for which you do not have an analytical derivative because you, for any function you can always numerically approximate the derivative so I hope this is uh, <coughs> clear now I have a warning here at the end and that is that you can imagine that you do 15 iterations that's the maximum number that is specified in the code and that we do not that line 89 is not true that, that, that we do not find a root that is within the tolerance specified for f and x and that's why we have line 101 that said you know if I go through this entire while loop and after 15 iterations I didn't find something that I was looking for within the tolerance then there's a statement made by the code on line 101 the, the function that said I couldn't find the root with the settings that you specified so please read the text yeah there's there's all kind of information here now what's most important are the hybrid methods MATLAB has a very nice built-in function that you can use that's called F0 function 0 okay and you're gonna use this in the exam too this is gonna be asked you're gonna use this this is an important function F0 is what we call a hybrid method and hybrid means that it uses the best parts of bracketing, bisection, Newton's method and the secant method to find in the least number of iterations the root of a given function now I still have the same function as specified before yeah I use this function here it's still in memory yeah and with this simple statement I simply get I have the root here so it's a built-in function that works with an inline function you can also write your own function like what we did with Newton where your function is a function script instead of an inline function and a function script is like this yeah but what we do here is for convenience we use an inline function so F0 is important know how to work with F0 F0 is a long script that's built in built by MATLAB and it has the best parts of each of these different methods to find the root of a given function and here I specify that my starting value is 10 and so you can specify whatever starting value you like I could start at 5 I could start at 0 and you see there's troubles if I start at 0 it gives an error so um, then you can change it you can use different values and each time what you should see is that you get the same I leave this out you get the same answer okay so if I then do fun r I now evaluate what's my function value of the R and again the fact that I only have four values here doesn't mean that this number only has four values here it's much longer but for convenience I have format short I do not use format long because then we have a lot of numbers here okay so if I calculate the function value at the root you see that it's really really small it's almost zero it's minus 16 10 to the power minus 16 so please know how to work with F0 and F0 you can specify instead of an inline function you can specify again your own script 
and you do not need to specify a derivative. F0 only needs your function value. No derivative is needed. If it uses a derivative, it will use the secant method. So it will use a numerical derivative. Okay, which is also convenient. So F0, I reiterate, is important that you know how to work with that. So if you have any function, so instead of using the ABC formula to solve for the roots of a function, you can simply use MATLAB, you specify the function as an inline function, and it will tell you exactly at what values of x the function is zero. Is this clear so far? Now, you can also define all kind of additional input arguments. I'll let you play with that, where you specify, for instance, like this, which is an uh, additional input argument to F0, where we specify still that the root is the function name, F0, then round bracket, the function name, which is fun, which in our case an inline function, 10 is the starting point, and optim set is an entire array of all kind of settings that you can define as a user. And one of the things I define there, that I want the tolerance of x, to be 0 0.05. So I want the x value that I get needs to be within 0 0.05 of the truth. That's what I specified here. Okay, so you can execute this statement and I also specified that I want display there. Display iterations. Okay, so display the results. You can ask for that. If not, nothing is displayed. And this is what the F0 gives you, it gives you output writing and it tells you exactly what it does, what the function value was, so you see a little idea of bracketing where you have A and B uh, or bisection, then you have the function value of A, you have the function value of B, then it gives you the procedure, what, time, uh, what type of pro procedure, then it tells you hey there should be a root within this interval, so and then it continues, and then ultimately it tells you, you know what, this is the, the root that I came up with. So it uses these different methods combined in one method, F0. Know how to work with that methodology. Now then the last thing for today is that MATLAB has another nice utility, is remember the function polyfall, I believe that was chapter 2. Okay, polyfall is a built-in function that assumes that you have a polynomial function that looks like cn plus 1 times x to the power n plus cn times x to the power n minus 1 plus cn minus 1 times x to the power n minus 2, etc. So look at line 144. Okay? That's the type of thing that polyfall assumes. So if you have a polynomial function that looks that way, then MATLAB has a built-in script that can evaluate the polynomial function like that. You only have to specify those coefficients c in a vector where the first value of the vector is c1, the second value of the vector is c2, the third one is c3, and the last one is cn plus 1. And what you specify as second input argument with polyfall are the x values at which you like to evaluate the function. And that can be a single value or a vector. So go back to chapter 2 and go over those lecture scripts. Now the nice thing is is that MATLAB has a built-in function that for polynomial functions that are identical to those with that formulation where you have something raised to the power n, to the power n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, whatever. MATLAB has a built-in function that's called roots that will immediately give you the roots of that function. So 
Look at the example. I have an example there on line 145 that said my function value is x squared minus 3x plus 2. Okay, if you do the ABC formula, you can derive that. You can find the answers. What are the roots of this function? You just fill it out. But what do you do in MATLAB? What you see, we have three coefficients. Our first coefficient is 1. It's 1 times x squared. Our second coefficient is minus 3. Our last coefficient is 2. So what I have here is I define, I ask for the function roots and the vector gives me the coefficients of the polynomial, which are 1 for x squared minus 3 for x and 2 for the last 2 for, uh, for the constant. So if I do this, you see that the roots of that polynomial function are 2 and 1 and you can write this out at home with the ABC formula and you will see that it, that it matches perfectly, okay? Now, obviously this is a very simple example. Let's look at another example here, okay? Here, like 150. Because most people do this wrong uh, on the quiz, okay? Because they forget that if there's a term missing, that you need to add a zero in the factor of coefficients. So here what we have is, we have 2 times x to the power 3, minus 5 times x squared, plus 2 times x. And now I like to know the roots of this function. So instead of using f0, I just use the roots option. Now, in this case, it appears that I only have three coefficients, which are 2, 5, or a 2 minus 5, and 2. But in reality, don't forget the constant at the end, because that is included in the function formulation if you look on line 144. It's asking for that. If you do not include that, then it assumes that that cn plus 1 is simply the last value of the factor that you specified. So in this case, we have a vector with four coefficients, which is 2 for x to the power 3, minus 5 for x squared, 2 for x, and then 0 for the last one, because there is no cn plus 1. So if I use this you see that I get three values for the roots, which is 0, 2, and 0.5. Now, and obviously, I don't trust that, so I like to check this. So I specify this function as an inline function. I say, you know what, evaluate this function between minus 10 and 10, yeah? And for good practice, we add some labels. So now what we have is here, this is our function. And according to our roots, this function has, to, to our roots function, this function should have three places at which it crosses the, x, uh, the y is zero uh, axis. Now, it's hard to see this way because you have values ranging between minus 2500 and like 1500 or so. So what you can do, you can use the zoom button and you just zoom in this area, yeah? And you continue zooming and you continue zooming and what you see you cross here you cross there and you cross here does that make sense so for those that are desperate don't know how to compute the root the easiest is plot that function you can always plot a function by defining it as an inline function plotting it for a certain interval and just seeing how many roots does this thing have. That's the easiest that you can do. Okay? Now, I can check whether those values that I cut make sense. If I do, if I ask the function value of the R values that came out of this roots function, then you see that they're all zero. So in other words, it's right. One last thing I noticed that when I went over my scripts again, that at some places, so now and then there's a little error. Error in the text. 
So if you feel that something does not make sense, contact me because I noticed one time with an iter with a counter, an iteration counter, and also in this script at the very end, I said there are five roots. So that's because those scripts were written at three o'clock at night, okay? So bear with me, okay? So have a nice weekend, have a nice barbecue, please study, and next week there's no quiz or exam.